Hi, this is JR, and I am reading the article, The Preference to Have No Preferences, and Shelly is on audio with me, and uh, so she may, I'll, I'll probably ask her a couple questions and ask her for input occasionally. Um, so The Preference to Have No Preferences is a title that I wrote after I wrote the actual um, article. Um, many people will make comments about their desire to have no desires or they would like to be free of expectations because they think of expectations as um, the source of uh, challenges and certainly expectations can be related to the experience of challenge but um, the idea of having no expectations at some future point and then how do we get to having no expectations that whole idea to me is distressed, hysterical, I, that preferences are completely natural and uh, they can be disorganized, they can be tangled, but the preference to have no preferences is a preference, right? Right, and a challenge. It's like setting up a fake challenge for yourself in a way. You want to say any more about the challenge thing? It seems impossible, you know. Oh, oh yeah, it's like impossible right. To, really to accomplish. Yeah, um, it is also from a poetic standpoint. I'll talk about this, you know, in the article as well. Why would people say that, and what what is it, what's maybe a more precise way for them to express express their interest there or express their preference? Because it's not really to have no expectations or to have no preferences or to have no desires. It isn't. I'm telling you, it's not accurate. It's not precise. And we'll get to um, some some of uh, my speculations about what it could be. Comments or questions? No. So the preference to have no preferences. Every creature experiences sensations. Like, you can hear this, right? Every creature experiences sensations and then reactions. The reactions are what, uh, their reactions to what, their reactions to sensations, to perceptions, things like that. When there are a variety of contrasting perceptions, then what happens? There will eventually be an experience of preferences. It's just that simple. You have enough different contrasts or enough different experiences, then there are going to be preferences. However, the idea of eliminating preferences can arise. When someone says that they want to eliminate preferences, that's a momentary statement. They're just saying that in a moment. And they may say that for, for months or for decades or whatever, but in the moment they say it, it's just a momentary statement. I want to eliminate all of my preferences. I want to have no preferences. I want to avoid expectations and so on. I'm, I'm going to actually digress from my plan here and ask you to speculate, Shelley. Why? Speculate what? Why do people say... I I wish I didn't have any preferences. So there, I'm 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 kind of reading, and then I'm also gonna gonna jump into a dialogue because I know what I already wrote. I just wrote this a couple hours ago. Um, because of the disappointment, I think attached to expectations or preferences, I would say. Okay, so um, there's there's disappoint so there's disappointments that can be related. Keep going. Um, I can guide you a little bit if you want it. Okay. That okay. Would be good. So in the moment, somebody says, I wish I didn't have any preferences. In that momentary statement, they're making an announcement. You know, They might think it to themselves, but I'm talking about if they're saying it to other people, whether it's in a you know, live in-person conversation or you know, an email or whatever it may be. Um, so the announcement is a passing reaction, a momentary, you know, construction in language, which is a reaction to a temporary sensation. There is a sensation that is triggering that statement. So why would someone say, I don't want to ever have preferences? They feel like they're being judged. Okay, keep going. Keep going. Um, they feel like they need to explain themselves or they need to justify themselves. Justify what? Um, that 
that they can't help it or they can't it would be so much easier if they were just a blank slate with no preferences but they have preferences and they um and that makes it more challenging right so it's hard it would be easy if but it is hard it would be a big relief but it is challenging so they're 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 actually dealing with you could say distress um, or stress, right? We for sure we can say stress. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a, a stress management technique. Is that right. clear? Okay. Yes. Right? So I wish I didn't have any any preferences because preferences are stressful. So that's that really makes sense. Mm -hmm. So why would my next question and I'm back to reading? Why would someone make a statement like I really wish? that I had no preferences. They're saying something very ironic, actually. I would prefer not to prefer anything. So that sentiment can be a sincere, hysterical hypocrisy. Is that clear? Yes. Um, meaning they could say it with a tremendous amount of intensity and they don't want questions or input or feedback. They're just, you know, it re almost in a mode of rage. I don't want to have any preferences or desires or stress or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So you can imagine frustration would go with that. Mm -hmm. So that kind of a statement or that kind of an experience that they're reacting to with the statement can arise with a sense of internal conflict or disruption, or disturbance. Clear? There may be a deep shame or despair. I'm, I'm never going to be able to um, overcome my disappointment or my frustration. That would be a kind of a despair or even could be shame along with that. Clear? Mm -hmm. um, and there's definitely fear. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping ahead, but you, you know, Shelly, that a lot of times I, re I trace things back to the root of fear. So disappointment is a fear about the future. Um, right. Anger is a fear, I guess is also about the future, I don't remember. Uh, no, uh, anger is a very present fear, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, or a more immediate fear. Um, so, people may make this statement, I wish I had no wishes, I wish I had no desires. Um, they may make that statement as a reaction to an awareness of naivety. Is that clear how that works yet? Not exactly. Okay. So tell me, how would an awareness of naivety connect to somebody having a reaction saying, I wish I didn't have any desires? Um, an awareness. Of an awareness of my own naivety. I've just realized I was wrong in my expectation about whatever. You got it? You're wrong in your expectation about something. Um, so you become aware of your own. I guess you're just. I, I mean, I'm still going back to explaining yourself, explaining why the disappointment happened. You know, it was, I had this preference. Um, okay. I have a good reason to be disappointed and, and you're and someone seeking validation of their, of their disappointment. Right. Okay. I, I can see. Unfortunately, I preferred this, but it was a stupid preference. I wish I didn't have it. Obviously uh -huh. it was a failure of a preference. Okay. So you're, you're talking about, you're, you know, you're definitely saying something a little different from where I was pointing, but it does fit. Um, so a specific preference or a specific expectation has been, has been violated or has not been fulfilled. Uh -huh. And the naivety thing is, wow, I really expected it to be, I, you know, I presumed one thing and that was inaccurate. Uh -huh. um, so... I shouldn't have had that preference to begin with. Right. And if I don't want to talk about that preference, 
then the, the natural thing to do is to scale it up or to zoom out mm -hmm. and say preferences. They're bad. I don't want any of them. Yeah. So then if I say that, I don't have to um, focus on the immediate trigger of that one issue or that one historical detail or a few things. You know, I had a horrible day. There was this and this and this. You know what? I don't want to ever have preferences. That's actually like withdrawing from the the individual triggers, right? Right. So there so that already points to why would somebody withdraw from the individual triggers? Well they're withdrawing from the individual triggers in order to withdraw from the individual triggers. But you know we could keep going with how that could be useful. Do you want to say anything uh, as I raise that question? How it could be useful to withdraw from the individual triggers? triggers. Yeah. Um, I think just to deflect or, or not talk about the embarrassment or the shame associated with it. You don't want to, you would rather just avoid it. Okay. Why? Why avoid it? Mm -hmm. um, what to do instead? Condemn. Oh, condemn all preferences, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Just sort of make a blanket statement that it wasn't just me. This is, you know, this is, um, this is something that's a, a giant problem in the world, uh -huh. you know? To right. deflect from the individual and the specific preference that's in question or that's being violated. Right. Yeah, and it could be several, but sure, it could be one. And then another funny thing that humans do sometimes is once they create this um, utopian ideal of uh, a world that's free from preferences, what's the next thing? <laughs> Anything come to mind? No. They're gonna. They're. They take on this campaign and the mission to create that that utopia. I'm gonna save the world from preferences. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. I'm gonna cure everybody from their mental, you know, affliction of having preferences. <laughs> okay, I got it. It's to start sending this message, this grand message of, I know something you don't. It's the, it it's the secret. Yes. The, the secret to not having preferences is don't have any preferences. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I said it first. And, you know, then you go and tell everybody, and then the world doesn't have any preferences, and everybody's happy and congratulates you for helping them so much, right? Right. Or at least that's the fantasy, and it is an interesting, you know, thing. The the mind, uh, when we shut shut off our attention from certain subjects, then it kind of it brings us to focus, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we we think, how could what could I do that other people would um, uh, extend appreciation and rewards to me, and you know, glorify my heroism and so on. Um, that's a perfectly reasonable uh, speculation or fantasy or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if I'm avoiding disappointment, why not jump way off into that, right? So um, I, I diverge from my script with uh, a reference to this awareness of naivety. So there's an awareness of naivety, a reaction to my naivety, oh, I made a presumption that was wrong, and then uh, we didn't actually cover this, Shelly, but I was uh, um, fishing for you to say something like, well, if I was naive about this and that and the other, good Lord, I could be naive about lots of things, and there's a general sense of fear and anxiety that would go with that. And then I say, I wish I didn't have any preferences. Why? As a hysterical re reaction to the, the distress. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. The distress of acknowledging, oh my gosh, I'm way more naive than I thought I was, which is always how naivety works, is I thought I was, <laughs> you know, I, I, I thought I was uh, um, more 
precise or astute or competent, and then, wow, I found out that I am not. Like, that's, that's what we call naivety, right? Mm -hmm. So there may be awareness of naivety and a terror about being naive, not just one case, but a general, you know, future or an ongoing state of being naive, also being confused, and ultimately being unsafe. Because if I'm unsafe, because uh, if my expectations aren't reliable, and I'm naive, and I know it, and I'm confused right now, and I'm in distress, then I don't even know if I'm safe or not. Do you get, like, mm -hmm. where, where that can, how that can spin off? Right. Um, so you're trying to avoid questioning yourself on a broader scale by deflecting from the personal disappointment whatever the preference was that you were disappointed or that was violated, you create this um, idealism or this idealistic, oh, well, all preferences are just dumb and we shouldn't have them and the world would be a better place to avoid ultimately becoming more self-aware or being more aware of yourself or, or feeling like, wow, if I failed on this preference or, or I misjudged this, then I could be misjudging this idea that I could be misjudging things all over the place, which is scary. Yeah. Okay. I could be misjudging, you know, things as, as dangerous that are really safe. And more of a concern would be I could mis be misjudging things as safe that, in fact, are dangerous. That's really the issue. Right. Um, and uh, to jump off into all preferences are, are bad, it's... It's um, it isn't really very functional. You can see kind of the intention behind it and the logic behind it, but it isn't necessarily very functional in regard to improving someone's you know perceptiveness in regard to danger and safety. It's not in on, it's not on that subject. It's completely removed from that subject, right? Mm -hmm. And so by looking away from stress, it's like closing my eyes, you know. If, uh, you know, um, I'm in traffic and I'm going to, and traffic is, you know, is, is, is so, so bad today. Well, I'm going to close my eyes so I can more safely travel. It doesn't work that way. If you're the driver, <laughs> if you're the passenger, that's. Actually, that's a great, um, you know, example I just thought of. If someone's a passenger and they close their eyes, it actually does reduce their, it could reduce their stress level relative to having their eyes open and seeing all the, you know, all the cars flying around or whatever, or uh, whatever the triggers might be for them in their distress. Right. So the next, so the first image actually, you see those images there? Can you tell me, uh, we're, we're, we're definitely running behind our schedule, so we'll probably have to chop this into multiple uh, segments, by the way. But mm -hmm. um, just tell me what's in that first uh, picture. Um, it looks like magnets. Um, that's one says, unlike poles attract, and the other says, like poles repel. So can you see, like, can you imagine the person moving their their bar magnet yes. back and forth? Uh -huh. right. Okay. So, um, opposites attract, um, same charge repels. So the simple reality is that there are, is a category in language called preferences. When there is a terrified shame about disappointed preferences, then the reactive behavior can arise of announcing socially that, I wish that I did not have any wishes, I would prefer to not have desires, I desire to no longer have preferences or interests. However, interest still exists. In, out in the world and even within me, interest may still exist. I might say, I'm interested in not having any interests, but interest still exists, right? Uh -huh. um, or preferences, whatever. So sometimes an interest gets fulfilled at, as of a certain moment. And sometimes one's interests are unfulfilled as of a particular moment, or you know, certain interests are fulfilled or not in that moment. Clear? Clear. Um, do you know what this next image is? No. 
Um, so those are actually uh, magnets that are like on a a rod or whatever on a pole. So those they're 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 spread apart from each other because of magnetic repulsion. Mm, okay. So they're they're loose. You can you can you can actually press down on that stack mm -hmm. and use the force of your hand to make them go closer together. But mm -hmm. immediately, if you release the pressure, they're going to raise up to that level. Okay. So I'll just give you a kind of a, a sense of what's going on there. It's it's uh, one of the more uh, familiar ways that children are shown how magnetic repulsion works, that it can totally counteract gravity as we know it. Mm -hmm. um, so why would it be so important to someone to avoid having interests or to hide those interests from other people? Why would it be important to announce that their main interest is to not have any interests or that their, fo their main focus is to not have a focus? So I'm kind of you know stretching the, the um, topic here. Um, any any comments so far? Um, I would say it's important. Or you want me to answer those questions? Uh, uh, if you wish. I would say it would be important to someone to avoid having interests or hide them to avoid judgment or to avoid the embarrassment of, of uh, um, any violation of those interests or any failure or whatever of the preference or wishes um, and it's important to announce I would say it's important to announce um, that their main interest is not having any interest to say I'm actually not that you know not that dumb I, I'm uh -huh. very smart right I'm and, smart unlike those people who have interests who are dumb right uh -huh. and I know it may seem like that interest or that preference or whatever was highlighted here but really I'm not that silly. I don't have interests and right. I don't have preferences. So I'm not, I'm really <coughs> smarter than you think. <coughs> so it's kind of like that opinion of, man, if I didn't see this coming, then what else would seen coming, which you mentioned earlier? Yeah. Um, so it's, so we're, so the second thing there of the announcement, social announcement is a, it's a pretense. It's definitely seeking to avoid, uh, uh, punishment or like criticism, something like that. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you could say that it's attracting, you know, validation or whatever other things, but but um, definitely um, saying, oh no, I don't have interests, but if I did, I know that would be dumb. So I'm setting up, here's what dumb is, here's what smart is, I'm identifying myself as smart, and and so on. And, ev and everybody else is dumb, and that actually isol is a Great excuse for isolating myself from others. So the value and function of isolating myself from others is to isolate myself from others. Okay? And it's perfectly valid. It's just there's this pretense in terms of the speaking that can be laid over the top of it. But to to you know target seclusion and produce seclusion, perfectly, you know, understandable, right? Right. Um we need to conclude here. Um, so you mentioned judgment. So the idea is, if I'm, you know, naive and other people notice it, mm -hmm. and they judge me for it, then there could be what kind of consequence? Really briefly. A lack of confidence in me or faith. What? What um, would? What specifically would be the result interpersonally if other people notice that I'm naive? Oh, how it would make me feel embarrassed. No, shame. what am I, what am I, why am I concerned that other people might notice how naive I am, that I'm naive? It's I don't want them to take advantage of me. Oh. Okay. I, I'm, I'm afraid of, of injury, of punishment, of, you know, of detrimental outcomes. Ah, uh, yes. So okay. it makes total yeah. sense. Yeah once you unwind the tangles. Um, so, yeah, our time, uh, we, had, we had planned to conclude by a certain time, so um, thank you for uh, what, you've, what you've shared so far, Shelly. I'm going to stop this recording now. Okay. Okay, so picking up with where Shelly and I had um, 
gotten up to under the uh, image with the the blue base and the red uh, donut shaped magnets. You covered that first paragraph, why would it be so important to someone to avoid having interests or to hide them from other people? So I mentioned the idea that we don't want other people to know we're naive and take advantage of our naivety. Uh, the next question is why would it be important to announce that one's main interest is not to have any interest or that one's main focus is not to have a focus. Um, and we, we mentioned uh, previously the idea of creating a isolation, social repulsion, um, seclusion, privacy, um, which also tends to correspond with calm, relaxation. So they, oh, and here I, back to my script, are they actually attempting to bring about an internal calming? Are they being socially dismissive and aloof? Are they creating a cushion for themselves to slow down and allow past repressions to relax, to allow suppressed disappointment and discontent to surface? Are they promoting privacy and seclusion? I've already given the answer that I I assert that's typically what's going on. People are creating repulsions to create seclusion, privacy, safety, calmness, relaxation, and so on. Here's a uh, uh, statement someone might make. I just wish that I had never, that I would never be disappointed in the future. That's what I really want, is to never be disappointed in the future. Can you arrange that for me? Is there a pill I can take, anything? I wish I would never be disappointed in the future. I wish that I had never been disappointed in the past either. I just wish that all my wishes were already fulfilled. And I didn't have any other unfulfilled wishes, you know? I'm scared that people might think that I would never experience preferences. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I stated that wrong. I'm scared that people might think that I would ever experience preferences or fear or disappointment or frustration. No, not me. <laughs> no. I'm, I'm, I would never experience fear. I'm just scared that people would think that I could experience fear, but I'm not. I don't, I'm not afraid. I'm scared. I mean, I'm not scared. I'm afraid that people might think that I ever was scared, but hold on. I think I, I must have read that wrong. Anyway, the next picture is um, two blue circles. S and N refer to south and north magnetic poles or positive and negative charges. And uh, you can see the very center between the two red dots, there's the, the arrows going to the right from the north pole of the, of the uh, blue circle on the left to the south pole of the blue circle on the right. And then you have the other uh, currents and charge flows that, that go on. There's a field created just by having those two, or there's a larger field and a flow created just by having those two magnetic um, charges near each other. And especially when you, when you line them up, when the charges are aligned, so the north and the south are aligned, then there's a flow. So we have some more images below that are from that same group. I'm just going to just jump down below the paragraphs, those next two paragraphs, and talk about the other two images where the two north poles are adjacent to each other. There is a repulsion happening there. Um, you can also see how the various um, arrows are indicating how you, know, you can have spin but you you wouldn't have attraction. There's a there's a repulsion. It's like count contrary winds that are blowing, and the it'd be it take a lot of pressure to get those those two blue dots in that case next to each other at least while they're in that uh, polar alignment of, of uh, two north poles next to each other. Those like poles will repel. 
So back to the paragraph above the first uh, double blue dot image. What is a preference? It implies an attention to two contrasting possibilities with a repulsion towards one and an attraction toward another. So a preference meaning I prefer this over that or I prefer this over those. You know, it could be some variation on that theme. So what's frightening about preferences? That itself is not frightening at all. However, people prefer not to feel in danger. People prefer not to feel frightened. So when they feel frightened and when they feel intensely frightened, uh, even traumatized, then they can freeze. It can actually, um, I didn't plan to make this reference, but it can throw their actual energetic alignments and, and electromagnetic flows within their body, those can be thrown off by stress, by distress, by emotional and uh, physiological, physical trauma, like a, a car wreck or something. Uh, obviously, it can bruise bones, but it can also, you know, when you have inflamed tissue, like it turns red, like a rash or, a, or you know, a bruise or something like that, well, look, there's electromagnetic activity happening there. If you're moving a muscle on purpose, then there's electromagnetics and electricity that are moving the muscles. Um, so if a muscle gets locked in a certain way, then that, that's an electromagnetic phenomenon. I, I mean, when a muscle gets locked in a spasm, okay? Um, so people might prefer not to feel frightened, or at least not to display fear or fright. So they block their um, facial expressions, and they have all sorts of tension in their jaw, and their neck, and their head, and their even their shoulders, to not make movements like "damn it" or whatever movement of frustration they might make. You know that kind of aggressive movement of. Um, waving your arms or, or even, you know, wailing for help. Oh my gosh, you know. So they don't want to draw attraction to themselves. In that, in a certain state of terror, any creature will freeze, play dead, uh, stiffen. Okay? So sometimes, um, a creature may get so frightened that it basically freezes. It holds its tongue rather than speak. I don't just mean for a moment necessarily. It could be for a few seconds. But it could be for decades that they hold their tongue and that the, the throat muscles have to suppress certain movements, whether that's crying, shouting, speaking at all, whatever it may be. That held tongue. A frightened creature may freeze and hold its tongue rather than speak. It holds back, and it holds off, and it holds up. Possibly. So what does it hold up? It may hold up a diversion. In fact, a creature may also fake that it's not afraid. It may publicize diversions like, oh no, I'm not afraid. Actually, I'm only wondering about, you know, that issue, not that I'm afraid of it, but because I recently read an article about it, that's all, but it's certainly of no real interest to me at all. No, no, but clearly it is very interesting to you. I mean, or you wouldn't have, you know, asked me if I was afraid of it. Um, it clearly is of interesting to you. So why are you so interested in it? Did you see the article about it recently as well? So that is like another kind of a... Uh, role-played conversation of somebody saying they're not interested and then inviting someone else to comment on on the topic that they say they're not interested in. Um, and they're also saying they're not afraid. There's no fear in the background. So when, when one person is afraid but saying they're not, then they'll invite the other person to talk. Well, what do you have to say about it? Are you afraid of that? You seem interested. Are you interested in that? What's interesting about it to you? So it um, deflects from them or, or you know, um, eases the, the pressure, takes the focus away from them, 
puts another person into the spotlight or it gives another person an opportunity to speak and you know at least distracts uh, if I ask someone a question it distracts them from it could distract them from whatever you know they were just noticing as far as I look scared or my face or whatever it may be so the next picture is um, actually like a from a book so it's got the the magnetic poles but it also has some text uh, magnetic attraction and repulsion which are basically magnetics so magnetics is attraction and repulsion those are the two phenomenon that you find in electromagnetics or I mean you could also say you find uh, currents and voltage and amperage and resistance and so on but basically attraction and repulsion are, are even foundations of that so you have charge then you have attraction of like charges and repulsion of I'm sorry you have attraction of opposite charges and repulsion of like charges and then when you put those two uh, uh, opposite charges together it creates a current and then you have all the issues of voltage and amperage and uh, frequency and just all of the issues that go with current in other words you go from the you know the raw magnetic charge aspect to the electromagnetic and the electronic and so forth so um, I like putting in these images and these references to just attraction and repulsion and magnetism they're just basic things there's nothing you know um, scary about these that I'm aware of there may be interest in these in magnetics there may be interest in um, repression and emotions and um, preferences obviously if you've if you've listened uh, to this point you must have some interest but why are you so interested in this I'm not interested I mean all the time that I've spent creating this that's I'm just doing this for you anyway um, underneath that that image uh, back to the the commentary the script People may prefer to shut down their displays of fear or even pre present pretenses of calm and confident. In other words, they may practice some of the behaviors that go with being relaxed, that they associate with being relaxed. They may display relaxation. And it may be a very hesitant and cautious display or, or uh, exploration. But when I display, if it's me, and I display elements of, of relaxation and calm, as I display those things, I may begin to actually ex experience relaxation. I may explore it, experiment with it. You know, I'm, tr I'm, I'm actually creating, you know, um, I'm attempting to create a more relaxing environment, right? Or a more, more relaxing social dynamic. So relaxation can develop. It can get further and further, more and more relaxed, more and more relief, calm. Even a sense of humor can arise. Here's another statement people might make. People should not have preferences about how people should not be. People should not have preferences about how people should not be. That would be ironic, and irony is impossible and also very threatening and therefore does not exist. The next image is showing a hand and then another bar magnet. And if you scoot the magnet when the alignment's in a particular way, it will move that whole, you know, it'll move the other magnet. Isn't that cool? You could just, you know, move one magnet that's in your hand and it will actually push that second magnet right off the edge of the table. So we mentioned uh, fear, display of fear, calmness, relaxation, a few things like that. What else can be challenging besides um, fear and stress? Well, the experience of fear can be challenging, but what about the fear of experiencing attraction or desire? Not just disappointment. Yes, disappointment is an issue that can arise here, a uh, fear of disappointment. But what about 
fear of temporary satisfaction or temporary fulfillment that then lapses or concludes or intermittently comes and goes. So just experiencing the desire can be a challenge. Um, experiencing a fulfilled uh, experiencing a fulfilled desire can then lead to a concern about well how do I maintain fulfillment of all desires or no more desires so I stick I stay at fulfillment those are um, you know reasonable questions they may be silly but they're also understandable you can comprehend how it could be that someone would actually construct questions like that in language to focus their attention in certain ways to avoid certain perceptions and experiences and to uh, cultivate certain other perceptions and experiences. Calmness, relaxation, a sense of humor, great. Privacy, seclusion, we mentioned those as well. Oh my gosh, another, another little uh, sample statement that some people, people might say something like this, oh no! No, not me. I am beyond such immature and unspiritual experiences. Certain kinds of desire can be perceived as threatening by certain powerful political interests. You know, the people I'm afraid of. So therefore, I cannot, not that I'm afraid, but if I was afraid, I, I would be afraid of them. But I'm not, because no. Anyway, so uh, certain kinds of desire, certain kinds of interests and attractions and uh, preferences could be perceived as threatening by certain powerful political interests, hypothetically. And so, therefore, I cannot have those dangerous desires in particular. You know, the particular ones that are dangerous, I can't have those. And why can I not have those? Because I don't even have any desires in general. I'm innocent. I'm safe. You see how that works? See? I'm, because I don't have, see, once I don't have any desires, then I can't have that one. You know, the, the one that I don't, that I shouldn't, I, I know, I don't even, I never did. It's not, no, that's wrong. I wouldn't. Me, no. Now, we have a picture of uh, somebody constructing, you know, they've got these colored magnets with the little silver balls and all these other uh, uh, colors. Uh, cute little girl smiling there. And uh, then the author of this presentation that I'm reading to you now wrote, is it safe to be frozen, to shut down, to withdraw, to display calm and relaxation, or at least to display an absence of desire? Is it safe to be frozen, to hold back, to hold off, to hold on, to hold one's tongue? Is it safe because of doing those things? Maybe it is safe and maybe it's not. It doesn't necessarily produce safety to freeze. However, movement may result in increased risk. It may draw attention to oneself. We think about a, you know, a couple of predator and prey creatures, right? And when the predator sees the prey, if the prey doesn't move, then the predator might not be able to, you know, if the pre predator, the prey is kind of camouflaged against the background, then once the predator, uh, <laughs> Once the prey stops moving, then the predator might not be able to pick out, you know, the outline of the creature if it's far away or, um, again, if the background is really blending in or maybe the, the, it runs behind uh, some bushes or whatever and the thing itself is, is green like a green lizard or something. So the lizard is, is, is visible, but because the colors blend in, it's hard for the predator to find it. So is it safe to freeze? for a few seconds or for a few decades. Is it safe? It might be safer to freeze, at least uh, for some duration of time. Decades? Probably we're talking now about um, hang-ups and, you know, uh, emotional um, challenges, emotional, like, dysfunctions even repressions. So lasting chronic emotional repressions. So those kind of free freezings um, can be very um, 
attractive and appealing in a particular moment or a particular period of time. But then beyond that period of time, if someone is stuck, frozen, then they may um, find it to be disadvantageous. They may be interested in relaxing their repressions and their tensions and their uh, suppressions and their, you know, pretenses and so forth. Is it safe to pretend to be frozen? Maybe it is, and maybe it's not. Is it safe to display to others that I have no emotional um, sensitivities? Is it safe to pretend that I have no preferences, that my capacity for preferences is, is doesn't exist or is numb or I've it's extinguished or I've matured beyond that phase? Is that is that safe or favorable to pretend to have no preferences? Maybe it is for a fleeting moment or for a period of time, and maybe it's not at a given moment, yeah. right? Yeah, but I prefer safety right now. Therefore, I demand comforting reassurances without regard to their accuracy. I prefer safety right now, so I demand from you comforting reassurances without regard to their accuracy. I want you to tell me the truth at least as long as it fits my preferences. But again, I don't mind if the truth that you tell me is not exactly precise or not even really at all logical or, you know, not at all true. But just tell me the truth to reassure me about safety. Earlier we had talked about perceptions of fear and um, being frozen in regard to um, not being sensitive to possible dangers, not being precise in one's assessments of possible dangers. So if someone, I, I think that we talked about that in this recording, if not, I was talking about that just recently. Um, if someone is strongly attracted, oh, the next picture is a, a little child with the bright colorful shirt and the uh, adult there, or maybe an older sibling, but probably a parent. Um, and they're doing some drawing or something, maybe some writing, colored pencils, that's cool. All right. So under that, picture if someone is strongly retract if someone is strongly attracted to perceived safety then that could imply what a present experience of fear a repulsion from a present experience of fear that's what attracts them to perceive safety however if someone is focused on completely denying the existence of fear out of sheer terror they are focused on totally repressing fear, denying the existence of fear, not displaying it, suppressing the, the ex, uh, facial expressions and gestures that go with fear, totally suppressing fear, then wouldn't their focus of suppression and denial, wouldn't that totally distract them from ever making any reasonable assessments of risk or safety? Because if they don't want to have fear, then they can't look at, you know, they'll be like, no, I don't need a safety belt. Well, have you, did you notice that there's, you know, it's raining and there's a lot of traffic and it's dark and it's windy and there's snow? Well, that's not important. I don't need a safety belt. I prayed before I got in the car. Did you check the, um, the uh, air pressure in the tire? No, I don't need to. I prayed. Well, did you check how much gas you have? No, I don't need to. I prayed. Well, how far are you going? 30 miles. And do you know what that little light on your dashboard indicates about the whole low fuel indicator? I don't need to look because I'm more mature than fear or concern or caution or stress. I'm very calm. So I can, you know, shut off the displays of fear and the um, awareness of fear within myself. I can pull the fuse on the little dashboard indicator on in my car that says I've got low fuel because I can't. What? How could I run out of fuel? I prayed just a couple miles back. So people might, you know, occasionally be interested in making assist assessments of risk and safety. Um, do you have enough fuel to make a certain trip? Do you have enough money to make a certain, you know, um, trip? Um, uh, 
is there enough of a room between the various cars to turn across a relatively busy intersection right now? I have to look. I have to actually look and be alert to possible risk and possible safety. And if I'm in this mode that, oh, no, I, the, ah, no, fear should not exist. That's like the most frightened, hysterical, paranoid thing of, you know, no, fear, fear is the only thing we should be frightened of. That's really ironic. The only thing we have to fear is paranoia about fearing fear of paranoia. So if someone was focused on completely denying the existence of fear, uh, especially within themselves, they might point it out in other people a lot, of course, but if they're denying it within themselves and suppressing it, then if they do that really intensely and really effectively, they're going to freeze themselves. They're going to paralyze themselves. They would go numb or make themselves numb. And if you don't use, you know, if you block, if you, what do you call it, um, pinch the nerves and block the nerves, and you never release those tensions, then you'll never feel, you know, that, that weird feeling in your gut, in your stomach of, oh, I'm scared. The butterflies, the anxiety. If you block those nerve signals, you can't feel when you have that feedback mechanism from your guts, from your from your stomach and so on, or anywhere else in your body. It's kind of like shutting your eyes. You, If you block the ability to perceive or sense that sensory capacity, then it's gone. So this, this issue of um, feeling out of breath, feeling the wind like the wind has been knocked out of you, feeling um, just, you know, tingling, shaky, um, weak, uh, maybe nausea in the, in the guts. So some of those really weak feelings, like I've got no, we, we, we have the saying, I've got a strong backbone, I really stand up for myself. Well, what if you have a weak backbone in a particular moment or in a particular position or posture or whatever, right? Um, it could be useful if you were uh, really doing most anything in life to be aware of your body's feedback mechanisms, your eyes, your, you know, feeling of, of your stomach, um, and so on. If you're going on a roller coaster a lot, then eventually your body might kind of shut down the association between, you know, the nausea of the of the stomach in actual danger. Your your body, your brain, whatever may may go, oh, that actually isn't that dangerous. I keep having that happen and it's not that important. So I'm gonna shut it out because it's distracting me. I'm gonna shut out the experience of, of noticing that queasiness in my stomach when I ride the roller coaster. So for somebody who, you know, rides roller coasters a whole lot as their profession or something like that, then it would make sense that they would go numb to it. They would become insensitive. But it can also be really good to reopen sensitivities, capacities to sense. The ability to notice fear, to build the ability to notice danger, that can be a really, really important one. So people who are suppressing the experience of fear completely, they would be paralyzed, numb, frozen. They would be holding themselves back in order to, to not, I guess you could get to a certain point of kind of delusional denial where you can't notice fear. Um, your body actually doesn't even pick it up. So you don't have to block your body anymore. You can just walk into ridiculously dangerous situations and you'll, you know, like if you're totally drunk or intoxicated or something. Um, you wouldn't be tense and pretending not to be tense. You would just be oblivious. But somebody who's holding themselves back by saying, no, 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 I shouldn't have fear, therefore I don't, and those kind of pretenses of layer upon layer of repression, repressing disappointment, repressing anger, repressing fear, uh, those, they just, you know, they eventually 
get more and more paralyzed. They would hold back their preferences and their awareness of preferences. They would hold back their interests and their own awareness of their interests. They would hold back their emotions from the display of the emotions and then also hold back their own awareness of their own emotions. They would hold back their observations. They would just you know, hold back their, their opinions, their perceptions. They'd hold everything back. You've got to block everything in order to block all possible sources of fear. What does that mean? Block everything. Go completely blind. They would hold back themselves. They would hold themselves back. They would be withdrawn. They would be remote. They would be reserved, repressed, and highly cautious. Here we have a picture of a child uh, along with an adult, and the child has a rather skeptical uh, look on his face. Definitely alertness. Definitely caution. Definitely interest. However, someone who was holding themselves back and was afraid of the display of emotions and trying to uh, block their own sensation of, of certain emotions that they call negative, well, they would have an immense desire to experience relief. Underneath of all those layers of suppression, they would have an immense desire to experience relief, but it would have to be um, you know, they'd have to be really confident that, that somebody would be, uh, that some situation or some uh, facilitator would be able to bring them or bridge them all the way from wherever they begin of these layers of repression and suppression and denial and pretense all the way to relief and calm and alertness and safety and comfort and reassurance well-being, clarity, so on. So those people that with lots and lots of layers would have an immense desire to experience relief and that, de that desire would likely or at least possibly be unconscious. They wouldn't know that they want relief from all these pretenses that they don't acknowledge they have. They're not aware of certain things as being pretenses. That's not a pretense. That's how I am. That's what I think. That's my persona. That's you know who I really am. That's me. Well, uh, I'm a person who knows that fear is stupid, and so I don't have any anymore because I just, you know, use willpower to not have any. The, the person who says something like that is saying it out of fear. Why would they say fear is stupid? Why would they have a superiority complex, inferior, inferiority complex around the issue? It's just hysteria. And so, of course, their desire to relieve hysteria would be unconscious because they don't acknowledge hysteria. They don't acknowledge even naivety. So one of the interesting things is for people to, for people to go from hysteria to, and naivety, to acknowledging their prior hysteria and naivety and panic and distress and fear and worry and caution disappointment and frustration and so on. So somebody who's got lots of layers of suppression could be unexplainably attracted to something or someone. Some, uh, something that maybe unconsciously, deep down, they think that there's a relief available through that conversation with that person there's some I feel comfortable with them and I don't know why that would be a typical statement they're not gonna say wow I notice how really really pretentious I am and that that other person allows me to relax through those layers and you know laugh at my own patterns and other people too So we notice there's going to be different ways that people will talk about themselves uh, at different levels of hysteria, calmness, alertness, playfulness, etc. Uh, next picture is a, a woman holding up a little note. Um, I don't know what it says. <laughs> um, so somebody with lots of layers of suppression can be unexplain unexplainably attracted to something or someone. 
Or perhaps the explanation is very simple, but they're just hiding themselves from perceiving that explanation. Maybe they recognize what is actually safe. What feels safe, they actually intuitively, without logical, uh, um, inductive, conscious process, without a conscious, logical process of deduction or induction, they just intuitively get, oh, that's safe. I get it. Or that person's safe. Or that, you know, uh, I'm going to go with that person or that group. That person or that group is safe, and they just get it. And it gets, you know, through their other filters and so on, and they're, oh, well, I, why would I be interested in someone who's safe? Well, they just feel that safety or comfort or security, whatever we might call it. Those are all in the same realm. So maybe there's a very simple explanation. They recognize what is actually safe, what feels immediately safe. They recognize it instantly. And so, if they do recognize something as safe, and they've got a complex of pretenses that they're still kind of sorting through, and what's a normal, natural thing for them to do to justify going from wherever they are towards safety? Brilliant. Humans are freaking hilarious. Um, they construct a fantasy of an exaggerated danger in order to uh, justify socially their instinctual interest and in, in attraction and moving towards the safe thing. They create a false danger. There's actually, that's quite functional, oddly enough. Because if you can't perceive danger at all and you're attracted to safety and then you create a fantasy danger, then that actually helps you to propel towards safety. It, it you feel that repulsion towards the false danger. It doesn't matter that it's a false danger. It matters that it's a it's a perception of danger, and uh, or, and it creates an experience of repulsion, which can move one towards launching into uh, a move towards safety. So false danger, great. Make up false dangers if that's relevant, if you have suppressed um, recognition of danger, perception of risk, then f fantasizing with an exaggerated danger it makes plenty of sense if you've, got, if you've got a target of safety. For people who just watch lots of horror movies or thrilling movies and, you know, really exciting, stressful movies, and they don't actually have any, you know, resolution to all that stress, that isn't necessarily healthy. <laughs> um, but if they, if someone creates a fantasy about, well, um, if I don't uh, get 10 yeses by the end of the month to the following issue, the following proposal, then I'm going to um, punish myself by not eating any uh, bacon for an entire week. And I really like bacon. So for somebody who, or whatever it might be for someone, so they can set up an actual point of repulsion. I don't want to go off of bacon for a week, so I'm going to try, I'm going to use that as motivation to, uh, get 10 or more yeses to whatever proposal, right? So people can construct a punishment, can construct a fantasy of, of, of uh, danger, of loss. It can be future projected like I just talked about a moment ago. It can be uh, present tense or past tense or what, whatever. There's all sorts of ways to do it. Um, and all of it is just to help propel someone towards something that really interests them. So that's that's why people make up fantasy um, threats, fantasy adversaries. Maybe they vilify a devil. What does that do? It justifies them studying um, a spiritual scripture. Great. Or going to a particular congregation. Fine. If that's the justification that works for you to bring you to that study or to that uh, event, you know, that's that congregation at that date and that time, that's, that's valid, you know, it's, it's fantasy, but 
um, to do it playfully or to do it with sincerity and, um, you know, uh, delusion is really a minor issue. <laughs> Get to the thing that is good for you. Get to the thing that appeals to you, that's safe, that you instinct instinctually are drawn to. Maybe uh, people vilify a devil. Maybe they demonize an enemy. Uh, not that there can't be real enemies and adversaries, of course. Uh, maybe they identify an apocalyptic threat to prevent or defeat or save the world from. So we're going to save the world from expectations, and here's how we're going to do it. Um, and of course, there could be apocalyptic threats, but we can make up one if we want in order to motivate things that are good for us. That's actually functional. That's a functional use of the imagination. What you could say, again, that can be done playfully, where I, you know, jokingly conceive of some story. I say, yeah, if I don't make 10. Uh, get 10 yeses to that proposal, maybe I'll do something crazy like not eat bacon for a week. At that point, the statement is playful. But I could be serious about it, and it's completely contrived. Who says I'm going to not eat bacon for a week if I don't meet my goal? Me. It's completely invented. We have a picture there of a a mother and it looks like a brand new newborn. Um, so maybe people, you know, construct a fantasy of an enemy and create repulsion and so on to to uh, propel them towards a uh, instinctual attraction. Or maybe they just experience the attraction. Maybe they don't need to add to repulsion. Maybe they don't need to detract from or cover up repulsion. They just experience the, the attraction. And if they announce a social explanation to anyone or not, if they, you know, if they announce, here's, I am attracted to blah, 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 and here's why, that is an, an entirely distinct issue. Th then they're attracted to that social display or that making that explanation. They're attracted to, you know, creating some kind of dynamic in a, in a relationship with someone or some audience or the public or less, the, the, the public, oh the press corps and the public relations firms and so on. They just, you know, they want to, they are attracted to some outcome that relates to PR or not. Or they're attracted to some other outcome or both. That's it. It's just, there's the instinctual attractions. We, we value safety. We value prosperity. We value health. We value whatever we value. And then there's all the conversations and stories and pretenses that we may have or explanations or justifications or fantasy. Um, uh, urgencies, you know, we can create fantasy urgencies, and of course, the to create we we also can be aware of fantasy um, dismissals. Oh no, health health's not important to me because I'm only whatever age, and I've got plenty. Of, I don't need to wear my seatbelt. Health's not even important to me. What do you mean? Look at oncoming traffic lanes. They're in, that's their lane. They, it's not like they're going to cross over the yellow line or anything. I mean, that never happens. So why should I even look over there, you know? I'm going to close my eyes while I drive because I don't, I mean, I'm not immature. I don't experience fear and stress. That stuff's bad. I don't like it. So I'm just going to close my eyes, okay? And if just because you're a pastor in my car, why are you such a backseat driver all the time? It's really annoying, okay? So it may be that people are in a partnership or alliance with each other in which some of the other participants are more uh, seem to be more perceptive about fear and risk and attraction and repulsion and all these things. Um, they may also notice one or more of the other participants or partners are less uh, sensitive, less perceptive, less alert, less astute, less clear. So that's how it works. However clear you are, you will probably eventually encounter someone that you perceive to be more clear or more perceptive than you, and less clear or more perceptive than, or less perceptive than you. However naive you are, or however, what's the opposite of naive, um, wise you are, you're going to find people that are less wise and more wise, that are less naive and more naive in your perception, in your experience of that. So what's your preference? Your preference is probably to be wise, to not be naive to be 
safe, to not be in danger, to be healthy, not to be ill, and so on and on. So um, that is uh, the second segment there. Um, thanks for your attention. Uh, feel free to share this video, to like this video, to comment on this video, and to ask questions as you prefer or desire or wish. Any of those.